Hi, could I ask you to introduce yourself and why you're here today? My name is Kumi Naidu. I'm the launch director of a new African-wide social movement called Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity. And I'm here for two reasons. One, to support the good work that Dorcas has been doing for a long time and to have the kind of critical conversations that they are having here with regard to trying to ask this very simple question. Are we fit for purpose? Are we as effective as we can be, what changes we need to make given the challenges that we are seeing in the world. The second reason is I wanted to connect with the African diaspora based in Ireland and I was able to do that so I'm very grateful. And what do you think are the biggest challenges facing the international development sector today? Firstly, I think we use this term international development sector as if it is one thing and we all understand the same thing. I think that uh, we need to revisit what exactly we mean by international development sector. Uh, but if we ask the question slightly differently, what are the challenges we are facing globally as humanity on the planet, I would say two stand out very strongly. One is inequality, the level of income inequality between rich and poor in every single country, the gap is growing faster and faster. And then the gap also between the majority of so-called developed countries and so-called developing countries is also growing. Uh, so I would say uh, inequality is a major problem. It's unsustainable. It's going to create anarchy and chaos. Young people are being shut out of the economy. People are going to universities in rich and poor countries, getting degrees and cannot find jobs. So this reality of 1% of the world's population owns like more than 65% of the world's wealth is untenable, it has to change. The second challenge is, I would consider kind of really game changing, is the threat of climate change. Because unlike other challenges like poverty, gender inequality and so on, where we have time to still get it right as we move forward, with climate change we got a clock ticking and that we are really five minutes to midnight, we are running out of time, the science is very clear that we need to act with greater urgency and I hope that as part of efforts such as those of Dorcas and its members we can accelerate progress on climate change and people should remember that the climate change fight is not about protecting something called the planet, it is about protecting humanity on the planet. The planet will survive, right? But the question is, can we fashion a way to coexist with nature in a mutually interdependent relationship for centuries and centuries to come? And put differently, the struggle is fundamentally about our children and their children's futures. And I hope that when we put our children yet to be born in some cases in our minds, that we will summon up the courage to make the changes that we need to make to ensure that we avert catastrophic climate change. And what would you say to the ordinary Irish person who isn't too concerned about climate change and really important issues like that? Well, I would say that, you know, just because today you are not facing climate impacts doesn't mean that tomorrow you are not going to face. Uh, island is an island. It's surrounded by water. And with the rate of the melting in the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, Ireland is uh, prone to the impacts of sea level rise. The rate of melting in both the Antarctic and the Arctic is much faster than the science originally thought. Uh, so don't underestimate the fact that there will be, that's just one of the impacts that people would have here. Secondly, I think, you know, Ireland is a country that has quite a good track record of standing up for injustice. I remember as a young South African activist, uh, a woman from one of the stores here, I think Dunn's store, uh, refused to handle, check out a customer buying South African goods. I believe it was oranges or apples, I forget. And, and I think she lost a job as a result of that for saying I won't handle South African goods because apartheid is wrong. Uh, and also if you look at, I encounter Irish people all over the world in my work who are working uh, for good causes, doing things that seek to improve uh, justice. 
Uh, and also, you know, Ireland is also a country, it might be in Europe, but it's also been subject to colonialism. It understands what it means to have another country come in with big arms and, and, and try and take over your culture and so on. And I'd hope that history gives the people of Ireland a sense that um, you need to stand up and speak out even when it might appear that it doesn't directly affect you. During the Second World War, a pastor called um, Martin Niemöller said, you know, first they came for the communists and I didn't say anything because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Protestants. I didn't say anything because I wasn't a Protestant. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't say anything because uh, I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was nobody else left to speak up for me. So I think it's important that you understand in a world that is shrinking in some ways that human solidarity needs to be stronger, uh, race should not matter, distance should not matter, basic human decency and is what I hope will prevail not just in Ireland but in both uh, rich and poor countries around the world. Let me say that it's not as if that climate impacts are not affecting developed countries, they are. Uh, it's just that it's on a different scale than what it's ex what's happening in Africa where I come from. So the sad reality is that even though Africa collectively as a continent has been least responsible for emissions, Africa is the place that's facing the most brutal and first impacts of climate change. And it's not fair that a continent that has been the victim of slavery, colonialism, being kicked around like a f political football during the Cold War and so on, should now also have to bear the brunt of climate change when our people actually on the old have not been responsible for high consumptive lifestyles and emissions. And I would hope for all those reasons that the people of Ireland will make the right historical decision and stand up for their children and recognize that the children of Africa or the Pacific Island states or the Caribbean Island states, all of whom are already very vulnerable, the children from those countries are no more important or less important than the children of uh, Ireland. I think we all love our families, we all care for our children, and I hope that when people make their choices about what they get involved in, they'll put the faces of children in front of them, and I hope that looking at the faces of children from all cultures around the world would give people uh, courage to actually stand in solidarity with those that are suffering first and those that are suffering much more intensely. What do you say to the consumer who is, whose choices affect every aspect, such as the agricultural industry, fashion industry? What do you say to them to drive the message home that their choices do make an impact? Firstly, I would say to people uh, that you must always assert that you're first a human being, a citizen, and then you're a consumer. That you have to recognize that buying things from a shop is a very functional thing that you do for life, for to eat, to socialize and so on. But people should not underestimate the fact that if they have disposable income, and in a place like Ireland many people do, that you have power. You have power to shift the way uh, products are produced, uh, how it is produced, uh, what kind of labor practices are, uh, are used by the people who produce them. And we have seen that the power of consumers when they are informed and are organized can be massive. When I was the head of Greenpeace, it was consumer power that got some of the most powerful countries in the world to stop and say, okay, we'll change our practice. And I'm talking here Coca-Cola, Unilever, Nestle, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, lots of high street brands. And it was when consumers started social media blitzes against these companies that companies started to change. And of course, the most important power people have is a kind of passive power, which is just to withhold your money and not use it for products that either cause harm or were produced in a way that exploited labor and so on. I think though that um, this is not all gloom and doom because hopefully people will realize that happiness comes from not what we own but what we do. Uh, in Africa we have a proverb which says 
I am because you are. A human being is only a human being through their relationships with other human beings. And none of us are islands. We need to start thinking very, very uh, deeply about what constitutes happiness. You know, is it about the things we possess uh, or is it about the kind of life we lead? As my late mum used to tell me, when you die, you don't take anything with you and you don't actually even leave anything behind, really. The thing that only matters about what you leave behind is the reputation of what you try to do with your life, right? And sadly, too many people around the world have been led to believe that happiness or success comes from having the biggest house, the most flashy car, and things that are often not needed for human survival. So I have been saying that one of the worst diseases we have in the world today is a disease we can call affluenza, where people come to believe that happiness and success comes from more, 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 when climate change is telling us we need to get smarter, we need to do more with less, and in fact, in some ways we need to do less. But the less that we need to do, I don't believe will reduce the quality of human life. Actually, I think could significantly enhance the quality of human life if we do it with thoughtfulness and care. So what is the biggest opportunity you think that is coming for the international development sector? I think that the moment of history we live in, which has seen a convergence of a range of crises all coming together at the same time, particularly when you add the climate crisis to it, is actually telling us something that I think the Chinese people get, which is that every crisis can be turned into an opportunity and the climate crisis in particular I believe offers us a kind of bizarre type of opportunity. So let me just say we've lived in a world for far too long, we've been divided by north, south, east, west, developed, developing, rich, poor. But climate change puts a different equation on the table. It says we either get this right as rich and poor countries acting together and we secure the future of all our children, or true poor countries who carry least responsibility for emissions are the ones that will suffer and disappear first, but ultimately no part of the world will permanently be sanitized from it. Having said that, if we engage in the transition that we need to make from an economy that's driven by dirty brown fossil fuel based energy to an economy that's driven by clean, green, renewable-based energy. If we did that smartly, we potentially can have a jobs bonanza, we can have better quality, air quality, we can have industries where people have more decent work. Have you ever met a coal miner who says, my ambition is to make sure that my son is also a coal miner? You know, I mean, these are jobs which are dangerous for people's health and even their safety and so on. So I hope that the fact that climate change now is really understood by the majority of the people in the world, with the exception of Trump and some of his allies, uh, will lead us to get excited about how do we make the transition from where we are to where we need to be in a way that also is not only good for the environment, but is also good for jobs. I believe young people today around the world are our best solution to the crisis because they have fresher lenses, they can look at the world in new ways, then they're not contaminated by bad experience, thinking that that's good experience and so on. And the other thing that makes me optimistic or allows me to not be pessimistic is the fact that I meet young people who have good ideas, courage, willingness to contest the status quo and so on. And my appeal to young people is do not accept this wisdom when it comes from older people when they say young people are the leaders of tomorrow because if you wait for tomorrow there might not be a tomorrow and young people need to step up now take leadership because people in the older generation including people from my generation I'm 52 we have run out of fresh ideas and we keep going through the processes of things that haven't worked in the past uh, hoping that they work now and you know, as Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results. So 
let's be willing to try different things uh, with we might fail with some things we might not get everything right the first time around but we know that we're heading to a on a suicidal trajectory if we don't act so better allow the space for young people to take leadership even if they were to make mistakes and and why should we not tolerate the mistakes when the current adult political and business leadership continually make massive mistakes and seem to be totally impervious to any sense of change even though they know that the actions that they take are fundamentally harming their own children and their children's futures. And do you believe overseas development aid works? I think overseas development aid can work, has worked and should work, provided it is done in a way that is thoughtful, that is not driven by the donor's agenda, that is respectful for what people need domestically. Having said that, of course, a lot of aid is misused and, uh, and, and is used for political advantage by those that give the aid. And sadly, we also see a lot of corruption in the countries where aid is received. So I don't want to suggest that the aid system is perfect. It's far from perfect. It has many weaknesses. But on balance, I would say we'd rather have a... Uh, uh, on balance, I would say that aid has helped in Africa uh, put more nurses in hospitals, more teachers in schools, better infrastructure and so on when well deployed. So I think ultimately we don't want to live in a world where Africa, for example, is dependent on aid. We want to be able to stand on our own two feet. But from an African perspective, we do not see aid as charity. We see aid as justice and redress for the theft during the colonial period and the way the global economic system was fixed in favor of uh, colonial countries, uh, colonizing countries and their allies. And it's high time we have a fair, just, equitable trading system that allows uh, countries like in Africa to trade. We would prefer to be able to stand on our feet on the basis of aid uh, sorry, on the basis of trade rather than aid. Uh, but in this current moment and for the coming decades, I think aid still has, on balance, a positive impact. Thank you so much for your time.